My name is David. I'm the co-founder and COO at Quara. Um, we're a fintech company based in uh, in Nairobi and Berlin. Um, myself, I'm I'm Dutch Indonesian, so I was born in the Netherlands. I grew up briefly in the UK, um, but my family actually is from Indonesia. So spent a lot of time there. After my degrees in uh, philosophy and tax law, I went to do volunteer work in Jakarta, Indonesia. I was quite shaped by it. I mean, we did a lot of impactful work. I worked for one of my family's foundations, but I also saw the um, dependency, let's say, on my work. So when after a year I left, all the work that I did kind of collapsed. It was very dependent on me being there. Um, and that's actually how I got interested in entrepreneurship, to work hard and to build things that actually are independent of you know one person's contribution. Um, I flirted briefly with PwC at the M&A department, but then founded very quickly my first company, which was an incubator, an incubator for people with a refugee background. Um, uh, ran that for two and a half years very successfully. It still continues to grow. Um, but I myself was always looking at a way outside of Amsterdam because this incubator was based in Amsterdam and Rotterdam. And I was quite intrigued uh, by what was happening, especially in Kenya on the African continent. Um, so I set up an investment fund um, and that's where kind of my story starts and how I how I found Bara and started there you have so many interesting diverse background so many i mean you have so many pieces uh, interesting mosaic in in your life <laughs> right yeah i mean looking back yeah maybe maybe if, if, yes, if i put yes. it yes yeah, but yeah. uh how did you meet uh, your co-founder at quara yeah tell, tell us but, some interesting backstory yeah <laughs> so my my co-founder and the ceo of Quara is her name is cynthia wandia um, a kenyan national but studied at yale in the u.s and then worked uh, across china uh, uh, Mexico uh, ended up working for quite some time at Eon in Germany. Um, she also, like me, had a company before uh, we co-founded Quara. Um, and how we met is that she actually came out of a venture builder, a fintech venture builder based in Germany. She had already started with um, the idea of Quara, initially analyzing the coffee supply chain. Um, her grandmother was a coffee farmer and she wanted to understand why um, uh, a coffee farmer in Kenya or in Indonesia, for that matter, would sell their coffee for $1 a kilo for it to then be sold for for 30, 40, 50 dollars a kilo in yes. Europe. With and, and what she found is Sorry, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. What you found is that the, especially the roasting process, which is very capital intensive, a lot of the big capital purchases that coffee farmers uh, in Kenya would be uh, able to do was only through this thing called the credit union. It was this bank owned by its clients where people put together savings and give each other loans. And these can operate at a scale of 100 people, 1,000 or several millions of people. But the credit union was uh, 20 years behind in terms of digitization. Um, and that's when her journey started. In 2019, she went with the first uh, operating system. She went to market. And at the same time, as I set up my investment fund looking for startups in Kenya, I found Quara, um, early days, uh, still a, a small team at the time. Um, and I was looking at how to invest human and financial capital. I had been backed by great LPs in the Netherlands, but we were interested in what can we do for startups in like real nitty gritty work. Um, and the first test of this investment fund and investment thesis was actually for myself to start working with a, with a startup and to be that human capital. Um, I absolutely fell in love with the problem that Quara was trying to solve. This was in 2019. Um, and Cynthia and I decided to start working together. Uh, the fund invested um, and um, yeah, Cynthia asked me to join and I wanted to join as co-founder and COO. Um, so that's how we met. We met in Nairobi in a co-working space, both looking for different things, but finding a very common cause and very complementary skills. Uh, I heard that uh, when uh, you guys um, met first time, the, you asked her to so many tough questions, put her in a yeah. difficult situation. What was, the, what was the tough question? I mean, I was, I was mostly intrigued by the sector. Um, actually, mm -hmm. growing up in the Netherlands, the uh, Rabobank, which is the third largest bank in the Netherlands, is also a credit union. It is a consolidation yep. of all the credit unions. Farmers uh, Credit Union, right? Farmers Cooperative. Exactly. Farmers Cooperatives. So I knew a little bit about it, but I didn't know at all how they truly operated. And I definitely didn't know how uh, important they were, uh, how important infrastructure they were for a lot of emerging markets, places like Brazil or Ecuador or Kenya or Indonesia. Um, so I asked a lot of questions about that. But I must say, I think our first conversation we had was like a two-hour conversation. We were drinking coffee and having just like, you know, time fl flew by in a way because I was also quite intrigued by her backstory. She, she like me, um, had dabbled in the NGO space. She'd done a lot of commercial work. I mean, she's eight years my senior, so she had much more work experience, but some of the elements were the same. Um, so uh, it was quite uh, interesting to hear what she had learned from the NGO space and what she did like about it, what she liked about commercial or let's say corporate, but also what she disliked. So we found a lot of common ground, um, a lot of shared values, um, but, but especially also like a, a very, very, at the same drive 
have to build something that really mattered. Yes, uh, I'm from the conventional banking background, so uh, I know the what is the limitation of conventional banking in terms of solving the problem in real world. So, especially yeah. for the emerging market, developing world, I think credit union or the cooperative could solve much more problem than the former and conventional banking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I think well, it's the credit union really works for you, right? So if you're a yes. depositor at credit union, you're also a shareholder, meaning interests are completely aligned. And what they've really nailed is, you know, customer relationships. Like often the history is um, with like a shared community, a group of teachers or a group of farmers. And sometimes these grow really, really fast and become open to, you know, any type of profession. Um, but they really nail the customer experience. And because the interests are aligned for shareholders yes. and depositors, the interest rates you get on your loans are the best you will find in the market. Um, at the same time, if uh, profits are made, which are made, and in Kenya, we're seeing anywhere between five to 60% uh, interest on savings that people put in, so saving, those saving those interest and that dividend goes back to the shareholders, it goes back to the depositors, which in yes. our view is the fairest way the fairest way of banking. C kind of a circular economy of a financial business, right? Exactly. exactly. Yeah, I love that. So related to services you offer, what is the mm -hmm. typical situation of credit union pre-digitization? And in other, in other words, what problem are you solving now? Yeah, it depends on the size. So if you go all the way on the, the lower end of the spectrum, the smaller credit unions, they operate on sometimes paper books or Excel. So completely offline, right? Yeah, I can if imagine. You the, if you go to the higher end of the spectrum, it is a bit more... Um, a uh, bit more advanced, but what they often look at is, for example, repurposed ERPs, which are really not built for financial institutions or uh, core banking uh, uh, platforms or core banking systems that are used by banks or MFIs. But what the problem is that um, for any of these options, none of these products is built truly for the credit union. So things like how to manage share capital, how to manage guarantors, which is kind of the social collateral system that credit unions employ with their members, none of that is there. And all the systems are either insecure, they're either too expensive from a user experience perspective, it's too complicated because what someone for JP working for JP Morgan Chase in the US needs to have is completely different from what a credit union in Indonesia. I agree. Would have. I agree. So, uh, nothing is built for them, and that means that they're losing a lot of time, a lot of money, and as an end result, their end client does not get the service that they truly deserve. Yes. So, what is the product? Uh, and services. So what is your business model? Yeah, so we have three uh, different products, all three with a different business model, but they're completely integrated. Um, the first product is an operating system, and it's the operating system for the staff of the credit union. Um, it's for them to add members, to approve loans, to pull reports for the regulator. They can do everything that they need to do on a daily basis, whether they're the CEO or an accountant on that core banking platform. Um, for that, we charge a SaaS fee. So it's a subscription fee ranging from $50 to $50 thousand dollars a month and um, the big ones have much higher budgets naturally um, but the second product uh, is the neobank app it's the consumer facing app for their end client for the member um, and this allows them to first of all have for the first time their services digitized so instead of filling a paper form to apply for a loan they can do it from the from the safety of their home and the comfort of their home on their phone uh, but it also allows for additional services so there we use the th our third product uh, comes in here and um, we have an open api to connect with anything that already has been built think of payment gateways think of credit reference bureaus different insurance providers um, allowing us to open up a marketplace uh, also again for the first time often for for some of our end clients um, now for transactions on the platform on the on the app we we charge a transaction fee and then for anything on the marketplace we have a revenue share agreement with with our partners yeah it reminds me that uh, like 25 30 years ago in asia some of the large government owned bank in asia they still the capital the paper ledger together with yeah. the IT system. So that's that's a more tradition. Even though they had a IT system, probably yeah. is a manage old management member. They don't believe in either. Not familiar with IT system, so uh, they still kept the paper ledger. So, like a credit union is not started as a, like a uh, uh, like a conventional or formal financial banking institution. So I I can imagine they have a lot of uh, old tradition, right? So it's a good 
opportunity for you to, uh, I mean, solve that problem, improve the, their operation efficiency and create a synergy. Yeah. yeah. And I think the beauty is that, you know, in, in people's everyday life, technology is penetrating our lives more and more. Yeah. Right. So people are trusting, you know, close and personal messages with their, with their, with their friends or their loved ones to WhatsApp. Social connections are made through, through Facebook. And even for, for let's say people who, who are uh, uh, from uh, like our baby boomers or from different generations, they are also uh, ca catching on to that wave. And naturally, if then you go back to your work and, you know, instead of signing up for LinkedIn in, in two minutes, but you have to become part of a credit union or you have to do your work on paper forms, that contrast is becoming starker and starker. Yes. Why is it that the uh, former and traditional bank are, are not as common uh, in Africa as other market in terms of scale? How big and active a credit union in sub-Saharan Africa now? Yeah, um, formal banks and traditional banks are, it's not that they're necessarily uncommon. It's just that their services are not meant for, for a large part of the population. That, that's what I meant. That's what oh, I so meant. They are not really <laughs> serving the needs okay. of, of a customer, consumer, and even corporate, right? What I heard yeah. from the... Uh, one of the CEO of the second-hand car trading platform in Africa. They are one of the biggest one in Africa. They said that the only one percent of second-hand car trading is financed through the uh, former financial institution. Only one percent. Like if you look at the, that same market opportunity in developed economy in Asia, it probably is ninety-nine percent, right? So even though that they have a bank, I it is related to my background. So they running the same process. They need to the uh, I mean, stick to the same banking, universal banking regulations, then is a customer doesn't fit into that the checklist, right? That's yeah. that's what I'm, yeah. that, what I try to ask you. Yeah, so I think indeed, like it's a cost is definitely a relevant factor. So, for example, if you look at like a famous German bank, they spend one billion uh, euros a year just to maintain and keep their uh, their IT infrastructure up and running. This is not improvement. This is not growth. This is just maintenance. And naturally, therefore, if you have such costs, uh, also in the case of Af banks in Africa, um, uh, you you need a certain type of of customer, right, that can pay. Um, and I think they still serve in that sense a really important purpose, especially for, for people um, that, that have more to spend or, or for some corporates. But the reality is that, you know, many people who want to take out a mortgage uh, and have to face uh, an interest rate of 14% annually, uh, this, is, this is unrealistic, right? So a large part of uh, people, not just in Sub-Saharan Africa, but also in Latin America and Southeast Asia, which are target markets for us, um, they're, they're either unbanked because they, they can't sign up, or even if they have a bank account, they're underbanked, they can't access for services so it's a matter of cost but i'd also think it's a matter of um, um a mindset um or, or maybe maybe it's a, a function of regulation because for example what a bank cares a lot about is collateral right especially when it comes yes. to loans so they yes. want uh, you have traditional collateral things like a car or a house or a plot of land um, it is not always the case that people have that and what credit unions do very uniquely and um in my view very apt for for the the markets in which they operate and the regions in which they operate they leverage social collateral so instead of giving up you know uh, your 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 house or your or your or your car you say hey i have two or three other members in this credit union i know them they're a family member they're a friend they're a colleague and if i want to borrow three hundred dollars and i have hundred dollars of my own savings not only can i leverage my own savings but they can also guarantee me maybe two people also a hundred dollars and those are bonds that are super strong where also let's say the repayment rate is increasingly high because uh, the credit union doesn't have to have like some sort of strict debt collection people settle them amongst themselves right if you've guaranteed for your brother or for your for your colleague then you know you ask hey what's going on the loan is in arrears how can i help out and you know how are we going to repay this because you're in it together and i know from from my family in indonesia these social bonds and the social collateral yes. is worth times more than than you know traditional collateral material collateral right that is very good i mean that's wonderful. Very good approach, right? I mean, based on my experience, always. Uh, I mean, you talk about collateral, but we also look. You were looking for the cash flow, right? Cash flow and collateral. So actually, they have cash flow to use the uh, support the operation. But they sometimes they go to the bank. But if you don't have a cash flow, I mean, as of today, you don't have a collateral. It's there unbanked usually, right? So yeah. I I'm familiar with the Chinese community. I'm from Korea. Even in Korea, I heard that uh, one of the family members member or relative uh, they got into financial trouble related to their business some other family member or relative took over support them to to, to make it turn around right 
So yeah. it, it's a good tradition. So how, what yeah. is the market share I mean, in the lending market uh, of the credit union in Africa now? Yeah, so uh, I'll, I'll look at savings because that I think tells a, a lot about like the behavior um, where, for example, in Kenya, which which is the market that I know best, I can't speak necessarily to every every African country, but in Kenya, uh, a third of all the national savings is put in credit unions. Right? So that's around $12, $12 billion. Um, in the global south, it's around half a trillion dollars that is held in, in credit unions. So this is 75,000 credit unions, roughly from Latin America all the way to Southeast Asia, um, serving around 400 million people who have all trusted uh, qu quite a lot, if not all of their savings to the credit union. Mm. Uh, tell us about your fundraising. I learned that uh, Quara grew the business very quickly since the establishment and successfully raised the second round of funding recently mm -hmm. uh, from in international investors such as SoftBank. So were they all excited about your business idea from the beginning? How did you create a sense of a VC for more when raising the fund? <laughs> um, yeah, I think what, what a lot of people were drawn to is that it's in a way, it was an unconventional and undiscovered problem, right? Mm. Especially because a lot of uh, VC funds are based out of places like Europe or, or the US where credit unions are not so visible anymore. Their impact is not so clear. Um, I think for a lot of people, it was uh, at, at times a discovery process. Okay, how does this work? Some of the questions uh, that we also covered uh, today. Um, but I think there, there were two elements that made um, that made people really buy in and be, be very excited and, and allowed us to raise a $4 million seed round uh, uh, late last year, in, indeed from the likes of SoftBank and Rega and some, some top angels. Um, and the two reasons were, on the, on, on the one hand, the simple one is that we were proving a lot. So yep. we were showing sales cycles were becoming shorter and shorter, going from three months to 11 weeks to six weeks. Therefore, also closing credit unions went faster. We were growing at a very fast rate, 40% month over month. We went from 10 to 50 credit unions uh, last year alone. Now we're already at 70 and the year has barely started. Um, the onboarding also we had proven could go very fast, which was something that people were worried about. Um, um, and we also had proven at the moment of raising that we could actually serve the end client at a transaction fee. Um, now, the second element, uh, and in a way, maybe from a from a from a value add or impact perspective, that was more um, more important, is that we're basically turning these credit unions into into digital banks, into neo banks, right? Because the end client gets to have a completely digital first experience, and not only the existing clients, those four hundred million people that I spoke about, but also anyone who wants to join a credit union. So you can download the Quara app, and you can choose similar to like how you would choose a house on Airbnb, all the different credit unions that we have you can join it within five minutes and this is completely opposite to the lack of transparency that there was on different credit unions what products they have and what fees they charge plus the process was tedious and what that essentially means is that contrary to some neobank experiences in europe or the us we're not providing you know a 5x or 10x improvement compared to a traditional bank account or standard mobile banking that people often have or almost always have in europe um, instead we're providing 100x improvement right it's it's a hundred times better because visiting a branch is super time consuming and if you have a job and if you have a family though that time is is incredibly valuable um, instead of having to apply for a loan and let that uh, paper you know sit on a table for everyone to view uh, lacking any sort of privacy um, everything that can be done on the phone is uh, not only convenient um, it is really uh, yeah uh, uh, experience changing so you didn't create you didn't intend to create it just formal you provide all the rational and logics for investor to be convinced gotcha. um, I, I don't think we directly um, played with investor FOMO. I mean, we we were clear on our timelines. We were I mean, yes. since we are, are always clear that we're the most passionate about working with the team, working with our end clients, just working on the business. So we did say we don't want this to be like a one year process, right? And actually, if you look at how quickly we closed, we also closed in a very fast time. Um, so in that sense, uh, people were aware of that. Maybe what did help is that once big players came aboard, so for example, the likes of SoftBank, then that was a stamp of approval in a way. So yes. a lot of the yes much much faster um and yeah people were not as you know maybe scared as they they might have been of investing in an african startup for the first time right i totally agree with you i uh understand i know that you're from the opposite side of the table right uh, your previous job background so what do you love most about your job at quara as compared to your previous job what is uh, downside upside your current job yeah um i mean 
Okay, so it was for me, it was founder, investor, founder in a way. Yes. And the investor period was in, in reality, it was very brief. Maybe that was a, a six or a nine month period um, just because we invested. The first investment was Quara and it was immediately the last investment before I told the LPs that we should put this on dormant because I really wanted to commit and, and really believed in this company. Um, and of course, I also understood that that would mean positive things for them if everything went well. Um, I'd say, I, I must say it's, it's a bit of a cliche, but I think we're able to draw in fantastic talent to our mission so we we really want to make building wealth together frictionless right and 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 that's what credit unions allow you to do right they you build well together you put in savings you 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 get different types of loans school fees loan business development loans throughout a lifetime where you can go from fifty dollars a month to you know earning five thousand dollars a month just because you're able to really build your career and your life um, but the process is not frictionless. It is a fraught of friction. Um, and, and we are allowing that process to become as easy as, you know, whatever you do and however you sign up on LinkedIn. Um, but there's so many people that are drawn to that. And maybe it's also a new generation. People care a lot about impact. Um, but that's one great thing that I love about my job. It's I didn't have this much talent in, in my previous companies and and and, and this many, um, which, which also then draws me to you know, the scale that we operate at, we're now with around 45 people, uh, mostly in Kenya and Berlin, but also kind of spread across the world. Um, I think we get to see how strong our values are. Like you really yeah. get stress tested the larger you are on what are your values as a company, uh, as as founders. Um, and I'm I'm very pleased to see that so far, and it's only been three years, but so far it's it's it stood the test of time. And I'm I'm very excited for 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 what is to come with even more clients and more users and more happiness and and more team members. Yes, I think uh, you have a r- right business model and right solution for the right market. Yeah, thank you. Very very good. So let's move to the some a uh, couple of the five. Fire, fire questions. So okay. give me a quick answer, a quick thought of you. What is your favorite <laughs> book and why? Um, I'd say Let My People Go to Serving by Yvonne Srinyar, who's the founder of Patagonia. Um, I think it just is an amazing showcase of how he was solving a real problem, uh, which yes. is bad declining gear um, and an unsustainable interaction with nature, very much ahead of his time because now everyone speaks about sustainable yes. clothing. But I do think he was an innovator, truly a pioneer. And we will look back, I believe, that's why I like it. We will look back at retail banking uh, one day in the same way we look back at you know unsustainable apparel practice. Is uh, something that exists but is a, a relic of the past. Got it. Actually, my daughter always wear Patagonia's clothing. So that's the way <laughs> how I came to know about the Patagonia. Yeah. So you are both side of the table in, in uh, throughout your career. So what are the one thing you want to change most in startup ecosystem? Yeah, I'll try to give a rapid fire answer, but I'd say in short, the, the perception that startups always are and always have to be disruptive. Um, I think in, in today's age, we've changed, really changed the way we can distribute, build products and, and serve customers. Um, that doesn't have to be a zero sum game. I think I think uh, um, uh, people have a choice. Founders also at times have a choice, and so do investors. Um, I think value can grow uh, and, and and be created just with certain lines of code or time spent listening or working together. Um, and for example, in the case of Quora, we're trying to add to something that has existed for decades. This institution exists; it's proven; um, it's growing actually still at ten percent a year. Um, but we just want to make it revolutionarily better and radically better. Um, but disruption, we don't believe, is an end in itself. We don't want to. I get rid of the credit union. And I think if um, uh, both people outside of the ecosystem as well as inside look at it at that way, then I think better companies will be built. Yeah, wonderful. Uh, these days, a lot of people talk about impact and diversity. I mean, everywhere in the business world, right? Even venture capital, yeah. startup, and the, even the business uh, and even fiduciary agent, they talk about uh, uh, ESG, those kind of things. So what is the view of about the diversity? Do you think diversity really helped to grow the business? If yes, and why? Yeah, my short answer is yes. And the reason is actually quite simple. Um, one of our six values is strength and diversity. Um, so we have 45 team members across a dozen different countries with different religions and different sexual preferences, all from different walks of life. 
And I think what it allows us to do is we're able to combine completely different worldviews and experience. And I say the answer is yes, if you have the right team, because I think if the right team is listening to the right arguments and are, are willing to choose the best arguments, then the very best ideas rise to the top. But if your organization is structured in a way that is not about the best ideas, but about the person coming with the ideas, then then probably diversity is not your best option. But overall, in our view and in with our team, um, we've seen we've seen each other really thrive. Yeah, I believe I agree with you. Uh, let's finish it today with a big picture. What is the uh, next five years for you and vision for your company? Yeah, for me, um, it will be continue. I actually doing what I what I do best, um, and that's making our team super successful. Uh, making Cynthia, of course, uh, successful by supporting her. Um, uh, because as a result, our customers are able to be wowed uh, with the best products, the best people, the best experiences. Um, I think. As a company, we're focusing on, on going quite aggressively in the Kenyan market. We're currently operating in Kenya, South Africa, and the Philippines. So we already are globally active, but Kenya is the fifth largest market for credit unions in the global south. So it's very important for us to establish a stronghold there. However, in the next two to three years, we will also start working on other large markets. These include Indonesia, Mexico, and Brazil. Um, but in, in terms of concrete results, you know what we're looking at is in five years, having five million people who are building wealth together um, and for whom that building of wealth has become completely frictionless. Yeah, wonderful plan. And uh, I came to have a next question then. What is, uh, now you're providing like a solution in terms of software to help yeah. the backend operation of the credit union, right? So mm -hmm. what is your logical next next step in terms of next phase? Are you continue to provide that solution or do you want to uh, transform to uh, in the different business model going forward? Yeah, I think our strongest, I mean, what we're built, we're, we're building software on one hand, because it's something that not that every individual credit union cannot build, but collectively they all need. But there is a second element, which is also not trivial, and that is marketing. So the ability to reach a younger generation, to make credit unions cool again to make people informed that is also a really important part of what we're what we're doing so um all our products are not focused on just existing members it is also focused on how can you in a very easy way join and how can you have additional services where we share revenue with the credit union but things like buying insurance you know, things like investments many things that people expect from a financial super app which is in the end that we, it's the thing we are becoming um with the one difference compared to any let's say random financial super app is that we have in terms terms of the credit yeah, and the loans that people get, we have the fairest institutions that are backing us. Um, and instead of us supporting the credit union, they will be supporting uh, for a large part us because they will be uh, applying a lot of their principles and their credit to a uh, fair credit to, to, to our, to our, to our clients or like our shared clients. Um, so that, that is, yeah, I'd say the marketing is a really important step. Um, from an infrastructure perspective, you know, the ability to bank and to um, uh, support credit unions with the cash they hold, the ability to uh, optimize on liquidity, um, the ability to give people credit scores. Like there's so many things that we can do because we're building the infrastructure for the first time. Many of these institutions have never been connected to the uh, formal digital infrastructure. So it's uh, endless opportunities. I think for us, the challenge will be uh, not to not to choose uh, uh, if we do things, but when we do them to make sure that our timing is right. Got you. Thank you so much for the taking time to introduce Krara and the Krara's vision. Thank you so much for having me, David. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, we should all the best for the success and growth of Kara.